Heroes. Luke chapter 2 is where we'll be at today. A hero. Isn't it what we're all really searching for? A hero? We are an entire culture that is celebrity driven, that is fame searching, and puts people like actors and athletes up on a pedestal. Why? Because these people are heroes. But the strange reality of it is this, that most of these people I just described, musicians, athletes, actors, most of these people, you would never leave them alone in a motel room with your daughter. Most of these same people, you do not want your son to emulate their character in his life. And most of these people, most of their lives will not end that greatly. If you've lived long enough, you know how so many musicians' lives end. You've seen so many athletes who made millions, hundreds of millions of dollars have to file bankruptcy in their life. We've seen so many of these celebrity marriages break apart because you buy those magazines when no one's living. We've seen them all break apart. The reality is this, that most of the people we hold up in our culture as a hero are not people we want our kids to act like or be alone with. And most of them, we know. You know how Miley Cyrus' life is going to end. You know the words rehab and divorce and addiction. You know that's going to be mentioned in her biography at the end of her life. So what is a hero? Well, if you're taking notes, we're going to give you something each week. But this week... A hero is a person who is focused on greater things than themselves. Someone who's focused on something greater than just themselves. You see, anyone can focus on us, on me. We love me. We can't wait to get me some me and to spend time with me. We're always on our mind. We're always thinking about what we're going to eat today. Some of you right now, you're thinking about that right now. Susan's so pastor gets done. I hope he gets done. I come to 9 o'clock because I can get out early and beat the methods in the cafeteria. <laughs> we're focusing on what we're going to wear, what we're going to be doing for Christmas season. It is easy to focus and please us. <laughs> Young people, you want to be radically different? Okay, this isn't even a God thing. This isn't even a Jesus thing. You don't have to believe the whole Christmas story to believe this truth I'm going to give you. But if you want to stand out from the crowd and be head and shoulders, if you want to be somebody that people look at and go, wow, look at them, just be someone who isn't focused on themselves. Because so few people are able to do it, you will stand out and people will go, look at that young man. What's so special about her? It doesn't even include making a Jesus part of that equation. You want to stand out? Be focused on doing something with your life that isn't all about you. Now, my goal, though, my goal is to make that one thing that you're focused on that isn't you, my goal is to make it Jesus. My goal is to make that one thing that you focus on and stop being you and not necessarily be a charity, not just be good works, not just be uh, feeding poor people. My goal is to make that worship and that direction and that energy to be on Jesus. Because here's what I've learned, young people. Here's what I've learned. Of all of those other things you could focus on other than yourself, he's the one thing i found that never brings trouble in your life. He's the one thing that if you focus on, you will never wake up with a hangover. He's the one thing if you focus on, listen, he's the one thing if you focus on and direct all your attention and worship, you will never throw the remote through the TV screen like your team makes you do. He's the one thing that if he becomes the it in your life, you'll never need a lawyer. So we start our hero series today, and we're going to be basing it on characters in Luke chapter 2 which is the Christmas story. And the first person we're going to look at today, we're not going to go chronological order, but we're going to take the first person we're going to look at today is a woman. And here's the problem with women superheroes. There are so few of them. In fact, one of the main superheroes is women. I like superheroes, by the way. I like comics. I like the, the comic books cartoons, I like the things, when Batman comes out, I'm there in the theater, IMAX, gotta watch it, okay? I like these. And there's really just one main female, there's a lot of them they try, but there's really just one main superhero for women, and that's Wonder Woman. 
And the problem I really realized this week, having to look at Google Wonder Woman, is there's not a lot of good pictures of her I can show in church. <laughs> so I had to find an old school comic. In fact, I found this one, and I kind of think that's the way Wonder Woman should dress. <laughs> but here's the thing about Wonder Woman. I don't really like her. Because first of all, she is a horrible role model for ladies. Look at the way she dresses. Girls, please, no. Don't do that, ever. But she dresses horribly. Here's the other thing about her that bothers me, because she sends the false message to young men. And the young men, false message she sends to young men is that all women can magically just spin in circles and change clothes and be ready to go. <laughs> I don't care if you're an Amazon or not, there is no chick on the planet who can change clothes that fast. Amen. <laughs> and the other thing that drives me crazy about Wonder Woman, the invisible plane. First of all, she's not invisible when she's in it. If you have an invisible plane, isn't the idea so the enemy doesn't see you? She you can still see her. She's just sitting like this flying through the air. And you, it shouldn't be an invisible plane. It should be a cloaking plane. Much, but the Romulans knew that. It should be a cloaking plane that hides you from them. And the other thing about the plane that really drives me crazy, she can fly! <laughs> Why does she need an invisible plane if she can fly? Superman doesn't have an invisible taxi. Oh, I don't have just drive her. The Superman going through it is an invisible taxi. No, it doesn't work that way. She can fly. Maybe she's not that even nice of a person. Who knows? Look at how she dresses. But in Luke chapter 2, we meet a wonderful lady. A woman that every one of you girls, I would encourage to be a role model in your life. Someone who I would not have to be embarrassed of showing a picture of them. Someone whose character can be emulated by every boy, every man. Someone whose just presence, you would be better off by just being around and spending time with them. We meet her in Luke chapter 2. But before we do it, we start the story. Jesus has been born. And we'll go through this throughout the month. We'll come back a little bit. And his parents are going to follow the law, and they're going to honor God, and they're going to bring Jesus into the temple. So jump back a few verses. Go to verse 21 in Luke chapter 2. And it says, And when the eight days were accomplished for the circumcision of the child, a little time out, people go, Oh, the Bible's not real. Um, vitamin K is what helps your skin heal. So when you have a scratch, if you don't have vitamin K, you have a vitamin deficiency, you won't heal as much. In your body, the highest level of vitamin K in your life you will ever have, doesn't matter how many vitamins you take, the highest level of vitamin K you will ever have is the eighth day of your life. God knows about your body more than anybody else. So it was on the eighth day he said, come to the temple and have them circumcised. And his name was called Jesus. And was so before the angel, before he was even conceived, conceived in the womb. You see so much obedience by his parents. Verse 22. And when the days of purification according to the law of Moses, another thing that God knew about that average man didn't know about, God knew about the science of the human body. This is about ladies after they give birth. We're accomplished. They brought to him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. This is baby dedication. And as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said to the law of the Lord. A pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. This is what poor people offered as a sacrifice. Joseph and Mary were poor. Little time out. Some of these TV preachers that tell you if, if you're right with God and if God really loves you, he'll make you rich. Well, if God thought Mary and Joseph were good enough to raise his son, why weren't they rich? But he will meet some people in this temple. And one of them will be a woman by the name of Anna. And that's who we're going to focus on. She is the wonderful woman. So skip down to verse 36 here. And there is one Anna, a prophetess. Now, a prophet or a prophetess, as a, as a female version of it, had basically two types of jobs. There were two types of prophet. 
A prophet was someone who foretold the future. And that's what most people think when they hear prophet. But a prophet was also someone who told God's truth. By the way, that's kind of what I'm doing right now with you. I am prophesying to you. I am telling you God's truth. Okay? Anna was not the foreteller part of it, but she was a teacher of God's word. You'll see sort of a pattern that develops here with Anna. She spent time teaching other ladies, other young girls, all about God's word. By the way, ladies, we're going to find as we go through this, there are no second class citizens with Jesus. Amen? Amen. They're second class citizens in religion. They're second class citizens in societies. But there are no second class citizens with Jesus. He brings complete freedom, and the foot of the cross is equal. There's no male nor female, Greek nor Jew. Amen? Amen. But we'll see a pattern develop in Anna's life, and it's really an interesting pattern. She knew God, she loved God's word, and she loved others. And maybe one of those things is missing in your life because you're missing the pattern. Before you'll ever truly love other people, you need to love God's word. Because it will teach you to love other people. It will convict you about how you treated that girl at Walmart. You shouldn't have said that. And before you love God's word, you have to love and know God. Maybe you're having a little bit of difficulty loving your wife, loving your father, loving your neighbor, loving your in-laws. Maybe it's because you don't love God's word. And maybe the chain reaction is taking place because you don't know or love God. Little convicted dog. Yeah. Let's continue in verse 36. Let's find out some things about this wonderful lady. The daughter of Penel, the tribe of Asher, she was of great age. Okay, she was old. Some of you, every now and then, I say that the old people, and they go, oh, don't call us old. The Bible calls you old. It's a badge of honor. If you're here and you're over 55, you're old. If you've got an art card, you're old. You say, oh, Pastor Steve, you've outlived all your enemies. Wear it and enjoy it. You're aging. Amen. <laughs> so if you like, I can't believe you said that. Okay, that's my one crazy thing. All right. And live, now what she says about her, and live with her husband seven years from her virginity. All right. She was married for seven years from her youth. And something happens. Verse 37. And she was a widow for about four score and four years. If I read in the King James, if you have another translation, it says it for you, 84 years. She was 84 years old. So let's sort of do some math here. Let's say in this culture, she probably was younger, but let's say she was 16 when she got married. And then she was with her husband for seven years. And then he died. That puts her at about 23 years old when her husband dies. And here she's 84 now. So even conservatively estimating, we're talking about 60 years without her husband. 60 years as a widow. And right there at the point of her life, she has a choice to make. She could get bitter. And by the way, doesn't she have a lot of reasons to get bitter? I've never met anyone who's bitter who doesn't have a good reason to be bitter. We can all agree with your reason to get bitter. She saved her virginity. She did everything the right way, didn't she? I mean, she did everything in the culture, under God, everything. And here she is, seven years, doesn't have a child, it says. And the man that she waited for, the man she probably loved, the man who was everything, dies when she's 23. Just too old for most people to look around and go, hey, I want a wife. Most people got married. It's kind of like a lady today. One of the hardest things a lady to be now is to be single in your 40s. They say you have a better chance of getting struck by lightning than to buy and marry a guy who's never been married before. It's a difficult thing. That's pretty much where she's at. She's like in her late 40s in our culture. She's 23 years old. She lived with this guy. She loved him. He's gone. She has a choice. Get bitter or get serving. You're taking notes. Bitterness is the fruit of selfishness. It's the fruit of selfishness. Meaning, my life is all about me. And then when it didn't work out, my life is all about me. And then when it doesn't work out, I get bitter. Newsflash for anyone in here who doesn't know this. Your life will never work out the way you think it will. I have come with 
young people all the time, like, what are you thinking about doing for college? And a lot of them are honest, like, I don't know what I want to do. And I say, exactly, you're 17 years old. You should have no idea what you want to do for your life. You're normal. Those people who think they got it all mapped up, they're not normal. They have a big surprise in their life coming for them. 16-year-olds shouldn't know what they're doing with their life. You're too immature. Anyway. But the young people, this is YOLO. Listen to me. You only live once. So you better do everything possible to enjoy this life. You want to know what YOLO leads? Bitterness. YOLO is the root of bitterness. It's all because it's all about me. My life, my pleasure, everything is about me. Young people, live your life for something bigger than you. Again, that's what a hero is. Again, I haven't found anything that fills that need to live in my life for anything bigger than me than Jesus. Your job will let you down. They will fire you. Make your life about something bigger than you. So here's the choice. Get bitter or get serving. Look back at verse 37. Here's what she did which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. She chose to serve. <clears throat> my husband is gone, but my ministry, my ministry just got started. If you're taking notes, disasters are not disasters with God. I understand in our life we see things that happen and they are disasters. And now listen, I have no right to tell you to get over your pain or the issues that you struggle with. You may have gone through pain that I've never gone through. And if we sat and told each other our life stories, yours is yours is, I'll just give that to you. Yours is worse than my leave it to be her childhood. I did that. You have all of that. But let me just say this to you. With God, though, even the most difficult things in your life are not disasters. Who ministers to former addicts better? <coughs> former addicts. You're, you're in here, you, you come to church and you feel bad. I got to ask you if I was divorced when I was younger. So not, not even everybody really knows this, but I was divorced when I was younger. You know who's one of the best persons to talk to young couples about why not to? Or maybe young people about maybe not choosing the mate you chose and how you went about it. You know who that is? You. Because, see, I can get up here and talk to these kids about divorce and oh, all this other stuff. Don't do this, don't do that, blah, 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 right? But you can get up and just simply tell your story and everything you learned about it. And see, at that moment, you thought it was a disaster. And can I just really go even a little bit further? And I just. People who have lost close loved ones. I mean, some of you have lost children. That's huge. Who ministers to people who have lost close loved ones better than other people who have gone through it? You see, at that moment you went through it, maybe it was a disaster in your life. And Anna's life was never changed. But disasters are not disasters with God. At that moment, her ministry began. She begins serving and living in the temple. And she comes in, part of the story, just after Simon blesses Jesus, just after Simon talks to Mary and Joseph <clears throat> holding the baby, and watch what she gets to be part of. Because of her faithfulness, she gets to experience this in verse 38. And she, coming in the instant, gave thanks likewise unto the Lord, and spake to him all that looked up for the redemption of Jerusalem. The English standard says this, and coming up at that hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak to him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. The Bible doesn't say this, but I know old ladies. It doesn't say this. I know old ladies. I know she held that baby. You cannot bring a baby around old ladies and they will hold them. I know she kissed that baby. She was here waiting for the Messiah. She knew the Old Testament. She knew the times were coming together that God was going to present the Messiah. She knew who Jesus was. We are going to find in this story, there's a lot of people who were searching. The wise men didn't just go, hey, there's a story. 
start. Let's find it. No. Putting together all the pieces of the Old Testament, all the prophecies, they all pointed to Jesus was going to be born. It started in Genesis 3.15. God had this plan. It wasn't an accident. Sebastian, how do you know the Bible? How can you trust the Bible? I put together all of this. 40 different authors, thousands of years apart, and they all works together and points to one thing, that God sent His Son for you, and it wasn't an accident, it was planned so that He could redeem you from sin. That is just too unbelievable to work together. I've been in enough church meetings to know people can't get along that well. Amen. Anna is a hero. And why? I'll give you two reasons why Anna was a hero today. Number one, relationships did not define her worth. Listen, especially young girls, relationships are part of your story. People who we loved, people who we lost. But Anna could have let this been known about her. <coughs> the widow. That could have been her title. That could have been what defined Anna. Oh, she's the widow. But her relationship with her husband, the tragedy that took place, did not define who she was. Her relationship was great, but what was even greater in her life was her relationship with God. Do you understand this? Young girls, your value is not determined by what boy or even your father thinks about you. It is determined, it has already been determined by what your heavenly father thinks about you. He thinks big, tall, short, fat, white, talent, no talent, black, white, red, yellow, green, whatever you are. He thinks that you were worthy enough to send his son to die on the cross for you. Relationships do not determine your value, girls. <coughs> Anna was a hero, and they didn't define her. Let me give you some relationship truths. First, relationships do not bring fulfillment. That's why people run from person to person, relationship to relationship, trying to find fulfillment. Relationships will never bring you fulfillment. Until you are complete, all you're going to do is go around messing up other people. In fact, can I give you this one public service announcement for why you and your wife and husband should stay married? Because all you're going to do is get divorced and you're going to find two other people and make them miserable. Do the world a favor and let's limit the amount of people that are miserable and keep it to just two. <laughs> relationships do not bring fulfillment. Secondly, relationships do not bring intimacy. As we've said before, exclusivity creates intimacy. Less people. Uh, parents, if this is true, maybe we should push back all of the love relationships in our children's lives. Maybe we push all that back and push back all the physical and the emotional intimacy. Say, well, my daughter's dating in junior high. Well, I would rather my daughter start dating like my older high school, maybe college, when she's a little more mature. And ready. I'd rather my son be dating and be in a more strict uh, uh, relationship when he's in college and he's more mature to make better decisions. Because if he's breaking up, walk with me, if he's dating and breaking up in junior high, dating and breaking up, oh, this relationship doesn't work out, I'm pitching it going up. And then we wonder why when we get like 25 and we get married, well, this doesn't work, and I'm ditching it, and I'm moving on. Why? Because we've established a pattern of relationships don't work, leave them. That was pretty good. Mm -hmm. and number three, this one will surprise you. Relationships bring happiness. Now, maybe that surprises you, but relationships do bring happiness. But here's the thing about happiness. It's fleeting. It comes and it goes. Every marriage, every relationship has its good days. But get this, this is so profound. This is like the best thing you're going to hear all day, maybe all week, is this. The biggest mistakes in your life will be in the pursuit of happiness. The biggest mistakes you will make is making me happy. You'll leave your family. You'll destroy your kids. Why? Well, I want to be happy. Every time I talk with married couples, say, well, I'm not happy in my marriage. Who said you got to be happy? I mean, none of us are happy. Why do you think you're so special you get to be happy? But marriage isn't about happiness. Marriage is about raising a family and children. Amen? You can be happy when you die. You'll get high. You'll get these conditions. Why? Because I want to be happy now. And listen, it's got to be good. So many millions of people are doing it every day. 
you'll get into crushing debt. Because at that moment, you'll buy a piece of plastic with a piece of plastic, and then you'll still be paying on it when it's in the garbage heap. Why? Because you have to have it. I want to be happy, Pastor Steve. I don't want you to be happy. That's why I preach so long. I want you to have joy. Unshakable joy that is not determined on relationships, it's not determined on who wins games, it's not determined on whether your job is good or your bank account. Your joy is determined on what Jesus did for you in your life. It's what he did on the cross for you. I want unshakable joy. Relationships will bring happiness, but happiness is always the result of the worst decisions you will ever make in your life. Anna had joy. Her husband died. Didn't stop her. I think they probably repossessed her house. She couldn't pay it. She was a widow. Took it away. Probably wondered where she was going to eat, what she was going to do. Didn't, didn't sell her. She probably, she probably wore the oldest robes in town. She's 84 years old. Don't you know this little 84 year old lady got out of bed every day and she lived with a man named Arthur, arthritis? And it didn't stop her. She talked to other widows, talked them God's word. She taught other young girls how to behave and what to do and what to do with their husband, maybe not how to treat them. Maybe little babies came in and she got to be godmother and grandmother to so many other people that she could have never imagined when she was 23 and she stood at that grave and watched them bury the love of her life. Never could imagine that all she did by faith was follow God. Instead of getting bitter, she got serving. Anna's amazing. What's a hero? Someone who lives for things bigger than themselves. Number two, why she's a hero? Options were not optional. It does not say how long after her husband dies, but she moves into the temple. And as I read that, and I just think about that, it seems like she moved into the temple because she just had no other choice. Maybe this is how some people view salvation, that you, know, you just sort of come to God and make Him the Lord of your life. And I don't necessarily buy into that. But what I do buy into is the fact that every believer will eventually make Christ the Lord of their life. Every believer comes to that place. Every one of you, if you know Jesus, if you really know Him, every one of you will come to a place finally when options are no longer optional. You may come willingly. That's the best way, by the way. You may come willingly. You may be dragged there by God. Or you may come to that point when God has just about had enough and you will come to that point in eternity. But every Christian comes to this point. You can either come to it today and serve the rest of your life as it, or you can come dragging, kicking, and screaming to finally get to the place where options are not optional and God is the Lord of your life and Jesus is everything, or you will finally realize that when you're standing before Him for all eternity. See, free people have options. But the Apostle Paul wrote this in Romans chapter 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to the apostle and separated unto the gospel of God. He is literally calling himself a bond servant, a servant who willingly <coughs> commits himself to his master. In other words, he was a slave by choice. Paul is willingly a slave to Jesus. He had no more options. And what did it do? It drove him to preach. It drove him to sanctify his life. See, maybe you've been in church and the pastor and the preacher have said, do this, do this, do this. Okay? And it kind of gets old and you're like, okay, here's the list. What am I? Okay, I'm probably with that other pastor on what you should do or shouldn't do. I mean, I'm probably with him. Get it? I'm in the union. Okay? We're on the same side with that other pastor. Okay? I probably am with him. But instead of maybe do, do, because, because, why not just make the because, because, because Jesus gets everything. <clears throat> That's it. Well, I tithe. Just because it's Jesus. I, I just do it. Well, I don't need a reason why. I, I, I change some things that are in my refrigerator. I change where I go on Friday night. I just, just, well, why don't you get high? Why don't you live with your girlfriend? Why don't you do this? Why don't you get involved in this? Why don't... Because it's just not what Jesus wants. My daughter asked a really cute question when we were driving. She goes, What's gambling? Mm -hmm. And uh, I just said, it's bad, don't do it. <laughs> and then we told her a little bit more about what it is and everything. But you know what? That's why there's no options. I don't need to know why, all the reasons, everything. I just, I just 
I don't have Jesus' hat. He's my Lord. I mean, if he told me to only wear plaid the rest of my life, I'd wear plaid. I'd look like I'm Scottish. I just wear plaid. But the great thing about it is he never told me to do something that stupid. Now, if some of you would get your life right, you'd start reading the Steelers. But anyways. My options, options. A person without options loves his good master. A person without options loves his good master. So you're going to serve something. Pizza? Drugs? Is your master going to be sex? Is your master going to be your house payment? Is your master going to be your job? Young men, will your master be your wife? You're going to serve somebody and something. Why not pick a master who is good and loves you and is looking out for you and wants only the best? That's called being blessed. So what are my options as a believer? Simply what Paul said. Tell the world. Be willing to serve. So you think maybe to tell people about Jesus, you have to take a class, and get a doctorate degree, or else, I'll just tell them what happened to you. If you were living your life and everything, you realized that something was missing, and you heard about this, and a friend talked with you at work, or you came to church because your wife drugged you, and you finally know everything, and you realized you were a sinner. Maybe your story's like mine, and then I didn't want to go to hell, and I was raised in a good Christian home and everything, and I was a young age, got down on my knees, and asked Christ to come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. I just evangelized you. I just told you about Jesus. It's not that difficult. You don't even have to know a Bible verse, but it's good to know John 3.16 if anything. Now, it's simply this. Someone has accurately said evangelism is one beggar telling another beggar where they can get bread. And then just be willing. God, you want me to go to Africa? All right. Look at me, God. I, I am not good for the sun. Look at the. I am, a, I am the whitest white dude you will ever meet. Seriously, watch me jump. It is bad. <laughs> God, you want me in Africa? Okay, I'll be in Africa. You want me in Illinois? I'll be in Illinois. You want me to do this? I'll do this. You want me to be a lawyer, God? I'll be a lawyer because God knows we need at least one out of this one. <laughs> My options are a believer of that. So young people. A person, a hero is a person who is focused on greater things than themselves.